ain't easy, but it's necessary. I be getting weary, cause shit be getting scary. But sit back, relax, and don't you dare worry. Cause I be hitting wrongs with a righteous fury. Yes, sir, see, I am the only one. My name is Josh Dunn, gonna have some fun. Telling the truth, y'all can't handle. I might raise a scandal as I dismantle. The fake make them quake and make them shake. I make you bad, but never will I make you break. Just chill, yo, and don't be frightened. Open that closed mind, it's time to get in light. Welcome, folks, to Gimpin' Ain't Easy, Cause It Ain't, episode number 16. Can't believe that, folks. 16, if... If numbers were years, that would mean our show would be old enough to drive. And uh, thank God uh, I don't because uh, I'm drinking and I'm not careful sober. Uh, I'm really pleased to announce we've actually got legitimate, real deal sponsors this week. Uh, it's fantastic. And if uh, if you'd like to learn about our rates, please hit us up at... Gimpin' Ain't Easy, or you can catch us at the Facebook book by the same na- uh, Facebook page by the same name, or me, Josh Dunn, on Facebook. Pleased to announce, uh, for the first time now, we're brought to you this week by Elsie's Vintage Clothing, where all the clothes are new to you. Hey, if nothing else is working in your life, you can live it in style for a reasonable price. We're also brought to you this week for the first time by... The Black Market, specializing in quality and affordable items from across the globe. We guarantee you, you won't be arrested at this Black Market. Also brought to you this week, once again, as always, by Café Sempoil, where you're guaranteed a good cup of coffee and a wide assortment of treats for insanely low prices, and where you get this Josh Dunn personal guarantee on this, you'll meet a whole cast of characters you won't see anywhere else and i was uh, gonna review a book this week but i think somebody might have pinched it so uh please 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 bring back the jewish epic novel only yesterday so josh can finish this and give you a good review and we're also brought to you once again as always by charlie's club yes toddy's back to work he's with the bionic ankle where most shots at charlie's are 275 on tuesdays so even if you make some real bad choices, you won't go broke making them. Folks, i like to talk this week about uh, guaranteed basic income. And I want to ask, like, how can you argue against it? You know, if you do, you're really saying that not all human beings have a fundamental right to their basic food, shelter, and clothing needs. Do you really want to be saying that in 2018? Well, not if they can work, someone objects. But should you really have to work to have your basics met? Whoever decided that? Is is that something we democratically agreed to? If you apply the must-work ideology, absolutely, that means any job is better than none at all. You can't really mean that. You can't mean it's more socially responsible to be a hitman than it is to have no job at all. Well, legally, socially acceptable jobs, legal, socially acceptable jobs, you emphasize with conviction. Mm, Okay, but is it really that virtuous to go to a job where you're completely miserable and treat your coworkers and subordinates and clients like garbage? But we've all got to eat. Yeah, but what if that was taken care of? Well, that sounds nice, but wouldn't people just be lazy? Sure, some would. But plenty of people are already pretty lazy anyhow, you know? Isn't it better to have that super lazy guy not be employed than have him neglect the maintenance of those rides rides at the carnival and have some kid die or have him dangerously undercook my burger and give me salmonella? Look, I'm not saying people shouldn't work at all. I'm saying they should be free from the obligation to work to survive so that they may pursue a life where they can learn and grow in an area that they're passionate about and that they ultimately get a sense of fulfillment and they don't have to feel like a failure if the pursuit of passion never monetizes. Undoubtedly, some folks would still be plenty lazy, you know, never find a passion and potentially never really contribute in any positive way to society. But with their basic needs met, they're unlikely to pose much danger to anything or anyone except their own sense of self-worth. And 
I got to think for the cats that show any kind of interest in anything, they're likely to be successful in their pursuits uh, free from the slavery of wage labor, more successful. I believe we could achieve our greatest potential as a species being free to dream. Just think of the scientific, medical, and technological breakthroughs we could make if uh, we weren't forced to spend a huge amount of our time doing something we hate. Hey, I think addictions would cut down too. Uh, people wouldn't need to seek artificial paradises near as much and as deeply if, uh, if they weren't forced to be somewhere uh, they don't want to doing something that leaves them entirely empty. I, for one, would take a bit less productivity for a healthier and more peaceful uh, society. Um, in a heartbeat. My heart skipped a beat. That's why I fucked that up. If the projected guaranteed uh, basic income were implemented, I would get between four and five hundred dollars more a month. That's a lot of bread, man. I'd eat better, wouldn't be so miserable about being poor, and being healthier would do a much better job on my work. So uh, pressure your politicians to implement a guaranteed basic income, income so Gimpin' Ain't Easy can be an even better show. And if you think that every human being has a right to exist. Folks, this week I have a uh, very special guest. Uh, She's here actually specially to do this show. She is an international sensation with, I believe, uh, 11 uh, and now uh, 12 soon-to-be albums on the way. Um, She's uh, currently writing her memoir. She's done some children's books. She was a teacher at one time. And this just in, she's thrown her hat into the race for the Nova Scotia premier (laughs) election. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Miss Little Birdie herself, Orit Shimoni. Well, hello. Hello, future voters. What's what's your pitch to them? Is you're just going to say hi to them? Or? Just going to make some positive changes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're going to be yet, but they'll be positive and there'll be changes. Could you be a little bit more specific, Barack Obama? Uh, not at this time. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's still better than what we have today. <laughs> so I'll vote for you. Um, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. Yeah. Uh I'm leaving tomorrow, so that that's always a funny feeling. Right. Yep. So, um, hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, I I just I just took a pause because I didn't know quite where I want to go. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm gonna go this place first. Uh, so why don't why don't you tell the folks starting off uh, what your childhood was like? <laughs> that's a pretty big fat question, Josh. Uh, it was uh, mostly normal in and I don't use that word very often because I know it doesn't really mean anything but in the sense of like two parents two siblings um two incomes you know like nothing was lacking uh but not normal in the moving back and forth between Canada and Israel so there was and was Calgary the place in Canada? Calgary was the place, yeah. Right. And Jerusalem was the Israel place. So you went from cowboys to the kibbutz. Well, Jerusalem isn't a kibbutz, but yeah. I wanted to do enough. the rhyme, you know, or the... the oh, sorry, I ruined the, your the rhyme. The sound. <laughs> it's not a rhyme. It's not a rhyme. I think there's another word for that, where the first consonant matches. Right, so you didn't go... Um, you didn't go to the kibbutz uh, literally. I just wanted to say that because I thought it was you were clever, cleverer than it appeared to you, apparently. You were kibbutzing. Right, uh, and failing miserably. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they kicked me out of the kibbutz. And that was that was just on Goddard Street. I don't know what that was doing there. But um, so why don't, you, why don't you tell folks a little bit about like, so what, like some some really striking differences between, say, Calgary and Jerusalem. Uh, a lot less political violence in Calgary. Oh, wow. And I thought they were pretty right wing out there. So no, A lot more snow in Calgary. <laughs> right, right. The snow cools down Those the, were the vitriolic two. haters. Yeah, it does, actually. When it snows in Jerusalem every few years, it's distinctly peaceful for... Those 
24 hours that it lasts. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, let it snow. Yeah, let cr Christmas or, or a more um, uh, uh, wide-ranging uh, holiday could maybe save us all. Just, just the god of winter could uh, bring world peace, perhaps. It's a nice little, like, quiet thing to snow. And, and was there different, um, like you were telling me, like, was, was shawarma in Calgary? <laughs> That's an inside joke between us folks. I'm sorry, you might never get that one unless oh, oh, Reed wants to tell you. No, that's uh, <laughs> that'll stay a personal, private joke. Uh, there may have been shawarma in Calgary, but I did not partake in it because when you've had good shawarma in the, you know, where it's the source is from, there's just no point. Right. So, um, I like to eat locally, like whatever's, you know, Alberta's got good steaks. Right. Jerusalem's got good shawarma. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Berlin's no, got good sausage. You know. You know your meats, lady. I like my meat. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you know them worldwide. Yep. So, like, was Really, it, I'm only on the road to sample the meats, and then I just sing so that I can get <laughs> pay from for your meat, meat station to meat station. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to all my vegan friends. I agree with you morally. I just don't have the same willpower. Yeah. My, my taste buds do not. And and that goes to you vegans as well. Uh, yeah. From me, uh, I need that meat. Unfortunately, so like we're <laughs> that's my slogan. We're we're kids. Um, I need that meat. I need that meat. <laughs> yeah, that, that's your campaign slogan, right? Yeah, yeah, it's actually the title of my next album. <laughs> oh, yeah. I need that meat. Yeah, uh, I I I did something like that, but I have a sense that it was a little bit different of a production that I was in. Um, but, uh, did, so, so were, were there like real differences in the kids say in, in Calgary than in Jerusalem or was it just people are kind of all the same everywhere? How, how, how did you experience culture differently growing up? Okay. So this is an interesting question because nowadays, if you ask me, how are people here or there? I'll tell you without thinking about it, that people are the same everywhere. Right. But as a kid, that was, there were such distinct differences between Calgary kids and Jerusalem kids that uh, I wouldn't have ever said it about my childhood. Calgary kids were wussies <laughs> compared to, I mean. You hear that, you cowboys? No, no, sorry. You I mean, it could have just been wussies. the school I went to, but there was like, um, and that's a little judgmental. Sorry, Calgary <laughs> youth. Uh, I'm sure you're tough as nails, but um, like we just, we were. <laughs> We were we didn't have to be home from school until dark, you know, like we walked, we did our thing, like we were kings and queens in the neighborhood in Jerusalem. Like there wasn't like this parental uh need to chauffeur for play dates. Like you just hung out, you know, and did stuff outside. And then moving to Calgary was like uh you need you need to be everything needs to be like you need a secretary to be able to play with your friends, and was, it sucked. Are you? Was that really your Calgary? Because I'm thinking that's Calgary or anywhere childhood today of like 2018 standards. But like, really, in like the 80s and and 90s, it was like that there for you. Yeah, and it may have just been like where the school was compared to where the houses of the friends were. And, oh, okay. but and, and also the just, weather. Like you right. just, it, it's minus 40. You need a yeah. ride. It's, just, it's simply not safe just from the cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, but it was that was a big change for sure to move to like from from a kind of like freedom of existence to a very like orchestrated and therefore less uh active child social life um and uh yeah be before before i like so i i know you as a, a musician right mm -hmm. and uh, predominantly and um I wonder, like, did did you have like you were uh, to to break this on inside story? You, it's uh, rumored that you were uh, singing before you were talking. So so there must have been some kind of early pull in there. Were were, the, were there other creative things as well that you were you were into from a young age? I used to draw a lot and paint a little bit, and I I think I liked every form of expression that was available to me. I don't know if I was good at the rest of them, but I wasn't terrible at them. I just ended up um, following the musical path more than any of the other ones. Like I used to dance and sketch and 
Isn't that an artsy thing to me? And how about, like, did you, did you scat? Like, beep, boop, bop, bop, do, do, deep, do, 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 abilities you did no but i was thinking i was i uh (laughs) on my little like she's not a german scat queen folks no and i find scat just kind of like a an embarrassing form but i was thinking about it very actively two days ago when i was by myself in this apartment where i was writing and i was singing my face off just because i could and i started doing a scat (laughs) solo which i probably haven't done since i had to in some class in high school so that's just weird no anyway no i wasn't a scat queen so um and oh yeah so i need to make sure like because when i when i um introed you on stage when you uh worked my my fundraiser there almost a year ago now it had been 10 albums to your name but i think it's now 11 with the 12th on the way is that so it's the it's the 10th has been recorded and mixed and is i don't know when i'm gonna release it but it's that one's done and then the other the 11th and 12th have been uh bed tracked so they're they're not bed tracked means uh i've laid down vocals and guitar to for to work on them further later okay right so there's work now on 11 and 12 okay yeah i thought i thought one other was completed entirely and and uh that, so yeah, the next one. It's uh, well. I mean, it depends what you call completed, but basically uh, We're ready to release. I guess. Yeah. No. I well, it's ready to release, but I'm not ready to release it. I ain't ready to release it, motherfucker. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all that matters, <laughs> folks. That's what it is. So it's ready to go, but not not for my stance. I dig it. So um, I know um, a little bit about your your like your education process so you you were you studied to be a teacher and and were a teacher for a while um and you were were you playing music during that time as well yeah I uh thought so, yeah pretty much all along i didn't um like i started playing little shows in high school like little cafe gigs and stuff in calgary and then i went to jerusalem for university and had a like a weekly gig in a cafe and there was another bar I found so I was playing but I wasn't um envisioning like a career future in it it was just something I did because I did it and it was as long as I was engaged in with it on some level I had other hopes and dreams at the same time too so it wasn't like it wasn't oh I'm gonna do this this I'm gonna be a full-time singer it was just I sang and wrote songs, so I found places to do it. Right. So there was an, always an interest. And I think um, you might have told me a little bit about uh, la- that last night, but um, or last night, uh, this morning. Um, <laughs> we're still awake, folks. Uh, this show is now sponsored t- by Johnny's Cocaine. <laughs> Woo! My nose didn't get this big for nothing. Uh, is that one of your sponsors or yeah. <laughs> Johnny's Cocaine? Fuck, I hope so. If they pay well, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, so um, what? What caused that? Like, and I, I mentioned in the intro that you are homeless. Like, what? What caused that thing to be that that break to be like? I'm gonna live a uh, somewhat normal life, and like music is gonna be this wonderful hobby and passion of mine. It's like fuck. Like this is what I'm gonna do. Uh, it was kind of gradual in its way. I I moved to Montreal and I started a band and was um, like when I was singing and before that I wasn't part of a music scene of any sort. I just went out, found a place to play and played it and whoever came would come to the show. But I didn't connect with other musicians or see what other people were doing um, with their music. And so when I moved to Montreal, that that changed everything and, and um, just having peers doing music and seeing how they it it just made me incrementally more ambitious or just curious if I could up the level of what I was doing in terms of skill but also in terms of like how busy I was going to be doing it uh and then uh I did a master's degree in the interim and uh at a certain point went fuck it I will probably I also by then, you know, I had re- released an album and it got radio play and I was like, okay, I'm not, this isn't a delusion. This is, people are saying it's good. So, uh, I should do something with it. And I got a, I got a glimpse of 
how much work it is just to book like one little tour and uh, was trying to figure out when I could do that work if I was teaching. So it could go in the summers when I had time off, but it just like I, there was an imbalance. And at a certain point I went, yeah, fuck it. If I don't do this full time now and see what happens, I'll be one of these old cranky teachers in the staff room who wishes I had tried it. So I quit teaching. Yeah, drinking your hard teas, fucking taking it out on the kids, you know? It's pretty rough there, man. The, those old-time burnt-out teachers, not a pretty scene. Yeah. They actually lunged at, like, the teachers that knew me before, <laughs> they, lunged. They, lunged at, they lunged at me. The, the teachers that knew me uh, before I told anybody I was also a musician were constantly on my case to, like, get married and have kids and buy a house and get a car. And as soon as they found out I did music, they literally lunged at me and said, don't get, like, don't get married, don't have kids, don't go do your thing, because I would have been an actress and I would have been a this and that, but I had a family yeah. instead. So I was like, okay, that was um, a pretty striking uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very much like after my own heart, like I, I have to be an artist. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm limited more physically than is obvious in the obvious physical ways I'm limited. So, so that, that path isn't even like a regular job is not really an option for me. Um, so I kind of like, I, I have to do this and I'm, I'm well aware, um, that that may mean, you know, I always find in like in entertainment, um, it's either feast or famine. Like you don't, you don't typically make um, thirty grand a year or forty grand a year or whatever, right? right. You, you make like, you know, seven grand a year or like a million dollars. I still right. Uh, right. look at my uh, very disorganized books at the end of the year and go like, I can't believe I make money doing like. This right, that I actually drew a profit at I, all. Uh, yeah, I yeah. survived another year just playing music full time and not do not having income from any other source is uh, like it blows my mind that that's possible because it's not a common way to exist. But I have no overhead. Right. Oh, and I did want to say um, one other thing, like just that whole like dedicated to the dream in the way that I am. Um, I think it is better even to live a life like failing at that than then to be that miserable teacher and to and just to, oh what but if you know I, what I, mean? I have to interject and just say i loved being a teacher like it right, wasn't right. a crappy well, job for and, me and at that all was just just, pure to, yeah. to have to have failed and to be you know a miserable call center supervisor who ab who abuses his employees yeah right? well to just to not have tried it just to see but it, i was i it was an experiment like well, let's see what happens if i take a year off teaching and then I turned that into a five year plan and then that turned into a ten year plan and it just kept rolling. I say, man, fucking dare to dream and uh have the balls or ovaries to live those out to to the best of your ability. That's or both. Or both. Oh fuck, if I have both, maybe I wouldn't leave home. And that's right, I know ovaries you can't really reach and play with as far as I know, but I still wouldn't leave home if I had ovaries. <laughs> I'd be very frightened. You'd be busy fertilizing yourself. <laughs> yes, yes, I yeah, I, I, I don't need a partner to have children. I will just impregnate myself. Boy, we're getting awful silly. I'm gonna get off this track real quick because uh that's that's gonna be <laughs> foolish. Um so and I, I mentioned this in the intro, but you know, part of for you being an international touring touring musician and doing it and not being a um you know a, a, a grandiose you know financial success a mega star a mega star yeah. means a, a snoop doggy dog as it were <laughs> um snoop underdog <laughs> <laughs> snoop underdog yeah. that's the both of us um and I, I really identify with the Scrappy Doo from from Scooby Doo, his, his little nephew. Do you remember him? I wasn't. I didn't see much of. They, yeah, they yeah. didn't have it in Israel. <laughs> yeah, that's, they didn't have Scooby Doo. We had the Smurfs. That was so okay. Yeah. That's all you need. If you have the Smurfs. Things dubbed. Are, they were dubbed. Happier, but but um, the point that I was uh, somehow going to arrive <laughs> at this was that that you, you live you live homeless. What 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 what's it like for you? And it, you know. It's not the same as just you know somebody living in one city being homeless. But what 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 does it mean for you to be homeless? Well, hmm, that's or, or I mean you. I'm writing an entire book about it, so I don't know if I can answer that in uh, two minutes. But 
Um, that also just kind of happened. I just I I was in Berlin for a year with a visa to be there for a year, and then it ran out, and I came back to Canada, and I didn't have a place anymore, and I had a tour booked, so I thought well, I'll figure it out in a couple of months, and then on that tour, I kind of thought, or don't figure it out. You can just keep touring and hold off for another few months until you figure out where you want to be and then 10 years <laughs> rolled by so um it's uh it didn't feel challenging probably for the first five years um because i adapt to spaces really eat like i don't i don't have high standards of like tidiness or comfort like i don't i don't care <laughs> thank god you might not have made it here to do this interview <laughs> i the scruffier the place the better for me because i don't feel like i'm too messy so i and i, I get along with people and I, I can fit myself in with you know if they're like snooty intellectuals i'm good if they're like whatever it's uh, i just i like talking to people and uh i'm conscientious enough to not be a terrible guest so it just kind of um, felt okay and I didn't have a home to miss so there wasn't like I couldn't be homesick because I didn't have a place that I was like when people usually go on the road they go on the road and then come home and yeah. so they might feel homesick or they might but I just there wasn't any there wasn't like a starting off point not even like mom and dad and the family and all well, that I hadn't lived at home like I had left home right after high school, so I haven't lived anywhere near my parents. I visit, you know, I'll see them, but I haven't lived anywhere near them for more than half my life now. God, I'm old. Uh, yeah. Uh, I feel you, sister. <laughs> it started to... So here I was kind of like, yep, I have no home. That's cool. I'm happy. That's good. I'm. It, it was a way for me to keep doing music. Um wasn't didn't feel particularly challenging and then i was invited to a, a show in holland of a blues guy named hans tasik he's a famous blues guy yeah we went to school together actually <laughs> right uh and he sang a cover of ain't got no home in this world anymore and i was listening to it and suddenly i realized i was sobbing because it was true and it hit me like from another angle i'm like holy fuck i don't I ain't got no home in this world anymore. And uh, and then the next five years rolled on. I um, did start feeling more like fatigue and anxiety and stuff over the years. And then I, when I tried to examine what my stressors were, because I didn't want to quit, like I, I still believed in what I was doing, I started to notice um, really small micro stresses in being a guest all the time and really right. and realize like oh, okay it's not like there's one massive thing wrong but there's every, every little thing is wrong I, everywhere everything well you hold your body in a in a yeah. certain degree of tension when you're trying to make yourself quiet and small in someone else's space and i think that that has affected me uh without me noticing it until i until things started just feeling bad uh it still didn't make me want a home yet though and a lot of people have said i should get one but i don't I'm not quite ready well and i also i mean i personally as your friend like feel like you should at least for a while just to like rest up and heal because for for those who don't know um uh she's <laughs> hurt her back very badly and she's in, it's almost reminds me of paul doing doing the fucking interview with the urinary tract infection oh god you know, okay well not, i don't have that right now that. so yeah it's a lot a lot of back pain those I'm are like, pretty nasty i'm i'm convincing her to take a a pill as I'm like sipping my whiskey and she's like, no, I said so I could breathe through the pain. Yeah. Instead. Right. And just be like a little more happy and comfortable, but but look at me. I'm happy and I'm yeah, as comfortable you're, you're, as I you're, get. You're pulling it off. Yeah. You're more charming than me right now. So, <laughs> you know, um, but, but I also, I want like something struck me there too. When, when you, when you don't have home in a particular place, um, there might also be this great freedom and empowerment of like the whole world is your home. Right. Yeah, there was a switch at some point where people asked me where I lived, and I'd say nowhere, and then I would eventually say everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. and it is like I feel at home in a lot of my friends' homes who've been kind enough to let me stay, and uh, I have 
circles of friends in different cities around the world. Like, so when I get to that city, I'll uh, invariably get a hug from someone saying like, welcome home. And it's, it's really beautiful. I can't imagine, like, I, I mean, on the one hand, I can't imagine continuing to live this way because it's obviously killing me. But on the other hand, uh, as soon as I picture like a nice little apartment, I miss having bookshelves a lot. Uh, even if I never read the books, I just like I miss. I miss looking at the books. I miss looking at books, and I miss sitting in my underwear. Um, like you know what I mean. Like just just privacy of existence. Me too, folks. I'm completely naked. We're all in our underwear right now. Yeah, I'm and not I'm even wearing them. Um, yeah, commando. He was, but they were offensive, so we had him <laughs> remove them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the censors made me take off my underwear. <laughs> Too many polka dots. <laughs> oh, good lord! Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I digress, or no, you digress. Yeah, yeah, um, but I digress. Um, so, if I picture myself having a place, I don't stop picturing myself touring, and so it like it just right. cancels itself out immediately. Like, what? How? What's the point of paying rent or somewhere if I'm not there? Right, it's a, yeah, it's a big extra expense. To keep a little shoebox for myself to visit yeah, when I'm not yeah, touring. To vi- right, so yeah, it would just be expense and a nuisance and uh, your landlord might be a scumbag and, you know, whatever. I mean, or right. I'd be trying to sublet it all the time. Like right. it just it's a headache. And even if I stop performing, which I don't see happening. Uh, I hope not. Well, you never know. Um, but thanks. <laughs> I... I would still want to go see the friend, like communities of friends I have in different. I don't. I don't see it stopping. I see it shifting, maybe a little bit, but I. It's not going to be like a cold turkey. And then she bought a house, right? <laughs> and never left. Um. So. Um. It's it's you know ten plus. I think probably getting on to eleven years on the road now. Um, and you are currently writing a memoir about your life on the road, essentially, right? Yeah. You're right. So um, why why now to write the memoir and not at like, you know, 73 or whatever the fuck? She's like 40, when folks. I'm 70. <laughs> Shh, don't right. tell him. I, uh, I mean, she's uh, 27. She doesn't look a day over 50. Um <laughs> that's the back pain I yeah. and the road I look amazing for someone who doesn't live anywhere you <laughs> certainly do eat uh, your head out Woody Guthrie there you go Woody was a good looker though um, oh yeah he didn't live very long <laughs> shh, shh, shh. don't jinx this um, what was the question Josh oh, um, why am I writing I, the book yeah, now why now why okay now? so I've been I've been writing it in pieces over the years just collecting anecdotes and reflections and I have, I've written one book before that was like for personal reasons. So I know my process as far as you write and you write and you write and you write. But at some point you have to sit with the whole thing and, and put it together. And you need, uh, like I can write bits and pieces while I'm traveling and touring. But I, the, the, where it needed to go, the next step was I needed to be in a quiet place for a a chunk of time that wasn't just a couple of days here and there. And so it felt like 10 years is a good, I've been wanting to take like a month in a cabin somewhere forever. So I just finally did it. And, um, um, that, that is, uh, act, yeah, what she did folks. And that is what she's just here, uh, finishing up doing and leaving, um, late tomorrow morning to go, uh, on, on the road to play in Ottawa again. And, um, so, why why Nova Scotia to to do this large chunk of writing? I came out here the first time before I was actually on the road. Like, I'd already quit teaching and I'd finished my master's. But I was, Oh, you actually got here before you, you went on the road, uh, like, officially? Uh, before I moved to Berlin. There's, there's, like, what I call the road is, like, homelessness. But I'd already, like, become a full-time musician. But I was just starting to figure out what the hell to do with myself with that title. And I was learning how to book shows and tours and all that stuff. And I, so my goals for my first year off teaching were get out East, get out West and get to Europe. And if I did those, even if I had like only one show in each place, that'd be fine, whatever. I just wanted to get to those locations. And I came out here with another singer songwriter because it didn't occur to me yet that I could do it alone. And 
it wasn't a good time as far as uh, the company or the shows, but I did fall in love with the sort of landscape and scenery here, pretty hardcore. And then I didn't come back for a number of years because there's no uh, public transit out here. Oh, in the well, sense of like in, subways in Greyhound and, shit, like. and well, no, yeah. Once you're here, it's a mess too. But like oh, to get here, I right, did everything by Greyhound bus, and then yeah, I could. Yeah. There were no Greyhound yeah, buses so out here. Yeah, only only train or plane. Folks. Only train or plane, which were very expensive. And then an automobile, and she doesn't drive. I do not drive, folks. Uh, maybe Thank one day I will. God. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that. I could be an amazing driver, Josh. I can't. See probably it. not. No. <laughs> okay. By the time I learn, the self-driving cars will be... Like, I think I've just waited it out long enough to to just hop into a self-driving... You know what I... And you can correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, but I think you driving would be (laughs) that you wouldn't get anywhere because you'd be, like, too anxious to make a move and you'd be one of those people that that you'd be stuck waiting for cars to let you you in and they wouldn't be letting you in. You wouldn't be aggressive enough to be like, let me in, you stupid fuckers. (laughs) That really hurts, Josh, because I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, and uh, I'm going to have to think about that. Yes, I come from two driving parents, one of whom is a fantastic driver, my dad, and my mom is a very anxious driver, and I most likely, uh, like, you can talk to my mom in the car, but not if she has to merge. <laughs> like, you just, shh, yeah, everybody has to be quiet while she, Sorry, yeah, I don't. I have to be the Borg and drive, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what kind of, I, I picture myself highway driving. I don't, and I can't imagine, like, trying to park in a parking lot. So, yeah. I, you know where I think you'd do good driving? In the woods. <laughs> I think you'd be, you'd be cool. <laughs> Like, on a road in the woods or just, like, through the trees? Both. <laughs> okay, I well. Think, I think you'd be pretty cool without fucking distractions and bullshit hoople head people. I have, both. the only place I've ever driven is Nova Scotia. And folks, that is why I'm disabled. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I'm such an asshole. That is not true, but I couldn't it was resist a, the It joke. was a beautiful, terrible accident. Uh, anyway, I came out here once, again, once I um, got involved in the Via Rail musician program oh yeah they let you like sing and give you a grub and stuff yeah and, like, you get a stuff. free for it's a good deal you get a free first do you get class a little, do you get a little cash too or well you usually sell a few cds oh, okay. but like you but get a first the, class yeah, ticket I meant, which I is like a cash from them no, no but like they the, hook you up. the ticket i don't know how much it actually costs normally but i know that the one i do from toronto to vancouver is like a 1500 dollar ticket like that's a that's a big value Ooh, wow yeah uh, so I came back here uh, to Nova Scotia, and I the first I played in Gus's Pub, of course, and uh, in a town called Port Medway. And I just like it's, it's big... like the antithesis of Jerusalem out here. <laughs> there's no like it's not a blood soaked place, and I'm sure there's it is in some ways, but there's just not this heaviness of like war history and there was something like i could feel the difference in my body and just went ah this is just a peaceful beautiful place in nova scotia folks we are too drunk to draw blood (laughs) you are internally fighting battles all the time out here but not uh with uh, our blood boils but never raises to the surface (laughs) yeah and i realized that pretty quickly too like hanging out with people like it's just a different type of um battle but there was, like, as soon as I got off the train, I just, like, 90% of my tension dissipated. And I've always felt that out here. So when I pictured, like, a beautiful, if I was going to take a month to write, I was going to do it in style and, and hopefully find a place looking at water. And it was just, like, I could go out west or I could go out east. And out east uh, seemed more, like, enticing. Yeah, it's... um. It's interesting. Like I've I've never been out west, but I don't really have like I don't and and you know forgive me I I I'd, I'd have to actually see to know. But my my sense is that I wouldn't really like Vancouver. You know, I just don't think it would be me. I'm too entrenched here, perhaps. But uh, yeah, I uh, wanted to. I'm going to throw this one in on you anyway. See what you come <laughs> up with here. Um, what does it mean? to be jewish to you to you personally you're literally like your questions are my chapters in my book yeah that's uh, another reason how we're kind of connected i suppose we're thinking similarly at least sometimes often yeah um 
what it means to be Jewish to me. Uh, to a very large extent, I will quote a philosopher. Or That's what it means to be Jewish. <laughs> Queen's quoting philosophers all the time. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it does mean that. Yeah, I will, to worry, therefore I am. <laughs> don't be making Jew jokes. Uh, <laughs> That's horrible. That is horrible. Uh, I do worry, though, and it is actually a cultural trait. <laughs> but you know what? It's a culturally inherited trait because of reality of worry when you're in a target of violence demographic. Um, that's just a fact. There's uh, a philosopher by the name of Hannah Arendt who uh, wrote that for her, her Jewish identity was in response to being identified by others as Jewish. And that really, really resonated. Because I, when I was a kid, I was just a kid. I didn't think about it, you know? Especially in Jerusalem, because I wasn't like the only kid not celebrating Christmas. Like, everyone was kind of, you know, everyone did their thing. And it was... So I didn't think about it until I was confronted with it externally. Uh, learned about the Holocaust at a very young age. Uh, so I knew that I would have been killed, so there's like a heaviness to it. Someone I met in in Amsterdam asked me if I was Jewish, and I said yes. And he said, that's a very heavy history to be born into. And I thought, that's a deeply respectful, understanding response that, that for a change didn't make me uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable thing. I'm not like a woo cultural pride kind of person because I just want people to just be there's a lot of beauty in some of the traditions, but there's a lot of beauty in all traditions. I don't give a shit. I, um, I've uh, interacted with that aspect of my identity from a, a pretty defensive position. Yeah, and that's very analogous to my own. I, I've, yeah. I forgot to do. I was going to do it first, but I'll do it now because it's still we're still on this topic. But um, I'd like to. I was going to say, well, I'll tell you what it means to be disabled to yeah. me, right? Just to be fair and just very simply, um, uh, one of the easiest ways I could sum it up is um, limited opportunity. You know that that's that's what being disabled is meant to me, both both physically and just culturally. Oh, and look, folks, here's my mother Tonto here with she's groceries a, for me. Being I'm a Jewish eat, mother, eat for another week. Yeah, she's being a Jewish. Yeah, let let her in. No, you should come in. It's all good. I can edit it out. No, leave it in. It's natural. Just come in. You've already done it. Just goes with the flow, baby. Uh, say he- say hello, Tonto. Hi. Oh, she's getting shy for the microphone, Aww. folks. That's all right, though. So I'm gonna get back to this being uh, being disabled business. So limited opportunity. Um, one of I suppose the positive things um, it's meant to me is uh, um, or at least been helpful is that I'm uh it I think it is easier for me to receive charity than the other person or than than an able bodied person let's say but um that's kind of fucked too because that sort of suggests that you need charity to survive right mm. so so I I sort of identify with it a bit negatively and I I really like your your um answer about I think like all people should just be because I wonder about that, you know, for things that, because like, you know, I know, I know there's disabled pride things and I'm, or like, you know, d- disability positive things and I'm I'm not opposed to that. But even for me, like when it comes to like, you know, um, like being gay or black or a woman, like, sure, those are things to be celebrated. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong there. And I, I suppose being disabled. Can those be- are things that, sorry to interrupt. Those are things that should be fought for to get human basic human rights right. and not have to deal with violence and oppression i but pride is not like a a word i associate with aspects of your identity right you and know? that and that and that's where i wanted to go go it's with it's not that. an accomplishment to no, be no, born a certain I, way i, I don't know? think so and yeah. i i don't mean that in any any as any offense to people who feel that way but even even those things those like positively affirming things like don't you lose some, or at least potentially lose some fundamental part of your individuality, you know, to be like, I'm really happy to be, you know, th- so so that's why I personally don't like get excited about being disabled, you know? Yeah, I think, though, um, that being said, that it affects 
because of the way people interact with you because of their f- thoughts and feelings about disability or thoughts and feelings in my case about Jew- be Jews or you know that does shape you and your interaction with the world so yeah unavoidable yeah um and so knowing that and having uh felt a very wide range of emotions thoughts feelings about that those interactions i've um kind of reached a point quite a few years ago where it was like well if people are going to identify me as one then i'm going to do my best to represent it well right yeah you know and not not be tokenistic tokenistic about it but just like well at least they'll have met one that they (laughs) you know and, but really, though, that means just like being the best version of yourself. Means myself, right? yeah, right? for sure. So, and and they want to put this classification or label on things or whatever, you know, like that. Then, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, no, I, I I think I think that's bang on on the money. And I mean, um, I'm I'm me first and foremost, and you know, all the positive and, and negative things that that means. I I think too that like. Being being um, defined by the people like that and having um, forms of oppression and and stuff like that um, can be a very bitter pill to swallow. But I, I I think that that adage of like what doesn't kill us or completely destroy us um, often can make us stronger. Really really does apply. I I mean it's it's theoretical to a degree in the sense that. Uh there there are actual safety concerns that you can't you know there was a shooting last week there was uh like there's you know people getting beaten up for their culture or for their whatever so it's um that does affect how you interact with the world and and how uh, brave and courageous you are and you know I was working on a I, I did write a chapter about kind of the Jewish moments on the road of of just like dealing with different aspects of that um but also was working on a chapter about ambition and and fame and success and drive and I realized writing it that um some of my like overly cautious nature around people which comes from having dealt with racism has affected how I am as a, like how daring I might be in self-promotion and getting myself out there. Like there's a timid aspect to my being that I know is directly linked to like a discomfort around potential racism that I'm going to encounter. Yeah. And that's so like, um, that it's always struck me as so, so horrible and Deeply so unfair. F- yeah. foolish races, you know, cause like I, I hate some people individually, but, but that's over what they've, what they've, and I, I try not to hate just for my own sanity and mental health and whatever like that. But, you know, occasionally I do. Right. But to, but to hate somebody just because of, you know, um, uh, their ethnicity or religion or, skin color or whatever your belief system, you know? Yeah, it is. It, it, it's, um, it's completely insane. And I, and it, it seems to me so unfortunate that it's informed uh, so much of the human experience throughout history. It's yeah. pure <laughs> blind bigotry, you know? So, um, yeah. And sort of uh, while we're on this, because I know, I know it's not like Jewish specific, um, would you care to talk about uh, your, your spirituality at all, which I think might be a little bit uh, Kabbalistic perhaps? <laughs> um yeah, it's. I guess the first time I called an aspect of myself officially spiritual, it would have been Kabbalistic, but not. I mean, like, uh, see, the first thing that people say is like, "Oh, like Madonna." Um, is this? Yeah. Is it really I, like I Madonna? Yeah. No, I have no idea what Madonna read. Yeah, uh, nor do I. So. But I know there's, uh, like. I'm not like involved in like, I don't go to workshops and, you know, I read a book and I talked to a friend who was into reading Kabbalistic texts and I liked, um, my, my, the most significantly relevant aspect of it for me is, um, a a sense that language has mystical properties, uh, specifically the Hebrew language, but Mm. obviously for me that applies into all language and that as a songwriter, is a pretty big deal. There is a definite mystical aspect to 
receiving a song somehow in your mind to then put out in the world and have that exchange happen. It's, it's, uh, that's as religious as I get when I talk about writing. For me, I, I feel like a lot of, um, of my creative inspiration has been, you know, a divine gift. It, it is like the stuff that I'm most proud of, you know, is, it feels like something more than the everyday ordinary experience. And it doesn't always reach that for me, like my own like quality of excellence or whatever, but, but uh, I think that's its ultimate source at least. And, and, and I think there's an elevation of experience sometimes. Like elevation is the best way I can describe it, where you're just more tuned in, uh, somehow more attentive. You just feel everything more. And that... I'm very reluctant to use specific words and say it's divine or God or this God or that God because it doesn't really matter to me because it could be uh, biochemical in my brain. It doesn't matter to me what it is. Right, the source. Yeah, um, right, right, right. It's, that's uh, less interesting to me and also a source of like argument with people that is, yeah. is not interesting to me. Uh, what, you know, and words like gift or a calling. I mean, like like we borrow from the language of religion to discuss certain experiences that we have as human beings even when we're not religious yeah i i I see them as mainly signifiers i think i think what you're getting at is is that you're more interested in the the effects rather rather what what the cause may or may not be. yeah and i'll say i can say that it feels like it comes from something bigger than me or deeper inside of me than my conscious but but it doesn't matter what if i call it the divine in me or I don't or call the it id, that, you know, or, or the id, or the like, uh, you know, joint, or whatever. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. Or the sacrum. Or the sacrum. Poor old sacrum. Poor old broke sacrum. Broken sacrum. Uh, sacrum. Yeah. So, so spirituality. I have a definite. Uh, there's a chapter on that in the book too. Um, uh, human connections that happen on the road, and like you and I, for example, have this super bizarre. Uh, psychic coincidence thing happening since we met, right? It, it is quite odd. It's odd, and it's but it's not that odd in my life. And there's something about being on the road right. that seems to uh, create a lot more of that weird synchronicity. And it, I don't know why and how it works, but I used to it used to scare the shit out of me when it first started happening, and now I'm used to it. So, may, I may I posit a guess? <laughs> I I think because you were on the road, not tied down uh, anywhere that when when you're in um a particular place you, you may be more at least uh often more more fully uh alive in it than than those of us for whom it's become routine so that you may I think be i'm open, in a state open, of elevation open, <laughs> open it, yeah. to receiving those connect well well and just very intense right so so it, it is and i yes i think like no place has has become routine for you, right? Or, or can yeah. I mean, well, it's funny because routine. like okay. by the fifth time I arrived right, at, right. in Amsterdam, like I stopped going like, holy shit, I'm in Amsterdam because I was just like, this is the street I take with my suitcase to get to my friend's place, and I had to force myself to look up and go, Orit, Amsterdam is a really beautiful place. Look up, you know. Yeah. So there, you know, probably the first five years there was no sense of routine, and then there did in its own weird way but it's not a it's a a routine that involves like three months in europe a year of touring and like being in alberta for one month and bc for one month like it's so it's not like what normal people call routine yeah but uh for me like the fact that for a few years in a row i was in alberta in october already started to feel routine okay so yeah there is a kind of routine but it, the, it's not the same as somebody that was staying in one place all the time no but you, what happens and it's interesting to to notice it in yourself is that like there is a constant newness when you're on tour like you're meeting new people all the time you're in new places you new food new language all that uh so you're heightened in your attentiveness, which turns out, by the way, is totally exhausting for the brain. I yep. tell you that, like seven years in, yeah, I you burn out. Right? There is a kind of burnout involved in it, but uh, you keep going anyway because you're crazy. Um, but the um, routine still sets in. So, like, I might be playing in a different place, but I'm still like, here we go, plugging the guitar. You know, like 
put the boots on, get up, you're going to sing for the people again. Like, and, and you shouldn't feel like that. And once you start the show, you don't because it is a different audience every time and you uh, have a very like unique experience each night. But the setup, the, the kind of, um, you're going to work, you know? Yeah. And no matter how magical a job you have, eventually you're still going to be like, fuck, I don't want to go to work tonight. I'm tired. Not tonight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you do and it's good. But uh, yeah, there's. it's funny that you can feel a routine set in even when there's no routine. When you're constantly on the move. Yeah. 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 That's really, really interesting paradox. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, what have been some of your greatest challenges? You don't have to list them all. (laughs) (laughs) well when i was born um i came out backwards like mental or physical uh whichever you like emotional or spiritual uh there's been a lot of challenges i think that's uh you know working on this book is it was gonna be like this light-hearted set of anecdotes and uh, like i should have known better because it was me writing it but that ain't you no, that, that ain't me folks uh, not that I don't have a lighthearted anecdotal side to me. I I just tend to philosophize about it a lot and get it deep and heavy at the end. And then we die. Um, I think, uh, like, like, from the most surface level to the deepest level, I think just the physicality of it uh, is is hard like it's hard to be the toll the roads taken on your body yeah it's pretty nuts and i don't know if i would have had the same body aches and pains if i had an office job which is definitely right? yeah it's yeah. possible that i would like people still have bad backs and you know carpal tunnel or whatever plantar fasciitis whatever people have those, those are common issues to to get so it's not uh just the road but uh The difference is when you pull your back and you have an office job, it doesn't make you question whether you should be working at an office. But the first time you hurt yourself and you're touring, you're like, I can't, I don't know if I can do, right? Like it's, there's something. Right. Yeah, because this life is so irregular. It's like, oh, it must be this. this." Everybody's first thing is like, well, I mean, look at the luggage you carry. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, but you carried like your three-year-old around all day it's there's uh well, i put that little guy on a diet so i think your <laughs> luggage is weighing a bit more than my toddler well you can't put an accordion on a diet uh i tried it didn't work <laughs> so i think the physical and also just like intense sleep deprivation and chronic jet lag and uh like my brain is trying to function in five different languages at the same time and so there's ju- it's just a a very demanding uh, like neurologically, physiologically demanding existence. Um, obviously, connections with people uh, that are deep are harder to navigate because you're in and out. Right. Um, and then there's uh, just like any artist doing something artistic is just like, am I succeeding or am I failing? You really have no gauge because there's no gauge. Right. There's external gauges that even if you achieve those are still bogus and you still wonder if you're successful. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of existential yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, strain on the soul doing this. But it's I like that kind of challenge. Yeah, that's that's really that's really interesting. And yeah, just how, how do you measure success? Well, is, is it financial? Well, yeah, there's a lot. There's of a like, chapter on that. There's a lot of one hit <laughs> wonders. But is that really lasting? And then and then it's like, well, did I did I, you know, um suffer my whole life but i like changed the canon and then you gotta look well the canon is like subjective too so so Uh, yeah you can you can undo any uh, notion i think for me uh just like a steady creative output uh has been not that it hasn't been challenging to have a like a steady creative output i don't have an issue like coming up with songs to write so um I know that when this is all said and done, either like I get squashed under a train or I die of natural causes in my, you know, 80s. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Maybe you get squashed under a train in your 80s. Maybe. Best case scenario, really. (laughs) Uh, I at least know I've put out a body of work that can live on without my body. And that's that's a good feeling. So that's that's a kind of basic. As long as I 
you know, part of me is like, stop writing songs, because as long as I'm writing songs, I have to record them. And if I'm recording them, then I have to take them on the road. And this never yeah. ends. But right. I do keep writing songs. So so um, so besides, uh, you know, producing a body of work um, that goes on, you know, after your body, um, <laughs> what what else would you say would encompass your greatest accomplishments? Hmm. Uh, it's not a, a tangible thing so much, but okay. I think um, one of the things I feel the best about is that, and it sounds very petty, but it isn't, especially when you live on the road, you kind of rely on like a, a social media community because you don't have a community otherwise. Right. Um, I feel like I have gathered you know, they're called followers on social media. That's obviously an awkward word to use. I've gathered followers on my journey. Um, I've gathered a bunch of people who I encountered authentically through music. Right. Uh, who have kept in touch, who cheer me on. And I've, you know, either through my music or things that I write and share on, on more kind of reflective posts, I really feel like the people who know me know me as I want to be known. Right. That's and really that's good. a big fucking deal. Like, yeah. you know, I feel like they know what I'm about because I have a platform to yep. be what I'm about. And it's it's uh, it's there's not there's no bullshit. Like it's uh, people who know me know me and they know what I'm about and my values like there's an alignment with what kind of person I want to be and what kind yeah. of person I am. And uh, I'm not saying like I'm great or perfect. I'm just saying no, that no. having that alignment is a, is a big deal to me. Yeah. And I mean, I, Cause I, I didn't have it, you know, and I, I didn't have it through my whole life. Right. And uh, I mean, I, I clearly, like I don't really travel much, so I don't have um, the, the reach that you have, but I think at least in, in Halifax, you know, people know who I am. Uh, and and I think that you know if anybody's uh, paid any attention to my work, um, it is it's authentic. Yeah, it, yeah, that's exactly the word I was going to use. Uh, if if it is nothing else, it is authentic. Even if it's yeah. bad, it's authentic. Yeah, yeah. Right. So so that's I, a big deal though because there's a know, lot of yeah. I'd, I'd rather be uh, uh, bad and real than good and fake. You know. Well, and there's a there's a place for uh, yeah. you know entertainment value uh, art or not art but entertainment value product that's sure. that's not about authenticity but that's not what you're about and that's not what i'm about yeah, and right. but authentic authenticity has become a buzzword in the industry so now it feels like an authentic inauthentic is, is word authentic to use anymore, but yeah. like fuck whatever you know what i mean like people, i just mean motherfucking real you know yeah just yeah just you know and and challenging myself to like keep digging into harder you know, some of the songs I've written more recently are like I would not have dared to sing them five or six years ago because right. they're uh, more political or more raw and less yeah. beautiful. I just did air quotes, but you can't see that on uh, listening. You know, uh, to be less concerned with whether something is beautiful or radio friendly and just just give the truth as you see it is um, is its own like creative challenge that that uh, I don't know. Maybe I haven't written half of what i'm gonna write yet so i'm as curious as the next right I, I i think it's really cool that you know as you've gone on you've been able to go um deeper into the reality of things and uh for those folks wondering um i i did see the air quotes and she's quite <laughs> quick a bit of a magician sleight of hand but she actually uh flipped me off while she was giving those air quotes so so um with that in mind is there uh besides the finger is is there anything you'd like to add about life or the or to, to hand gestures? Or to this, yeah, well, at all, period. Anything you'd like to add in this experience before I ask you the final question? Um, uh, I think you and I uh, share some of the struggles and frustrations of being a full-time artist. Artist sounds so... like I have So it's a little pretentious, doesn't it? It's I, a, I'm, I'm an artist. artist. <laughs> I didn't call myself a musician, and I was like... I talked about it with someone who's like, well, I don't know if I'm a musician. They're like, you've been touring internationally, like, full time for three years. You're a fucking musician. I'm like, oh, well, like, yeah, I'm not a musician. I don't know. But, like, it's not, it just sounds trite. What do you do? I'm a musician. I'm a 
I don't know. It all sounds dumb. Singer songwriter sounds dumb. Artist sounds dumb. I'm a writer. It all sounds like you're full of yourself. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but you got to be to do it to some extent, right? You got to believe enough internally. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to go around telling no, people no, you're no, an no, artist. No, no. Well, you know, like, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that like having to believe that what you're doing is good, but like be be in like crippling doubt about it at the same time. I think is a very normal. Uh, thing that that we experience when we do creative stuff i i saw this little graph one time that speaks like uh totally to that it was like like a graph on on the artist and like on one side was like um uh co- complete narcissism and like total self-doubt and paralyzed anxiety fear whatever like thinking you're worthless and yep. like the artist is like right in the middle of that one yeah it is, I, you, you do you have to be bold enough to think you're good enough to get on stage you know but i mean like part of that's like okay you'll just go up all mousy and play an open mic first if other people tell you you're good that kind of keeps you going too and so like it wasn't like uh i'm gonna go knock on like every record label's door and and demand like attention for it it was like yeah well you know my name's a reed i write some songs (laughs) you know i like singing and uh it took me years to uh, be less apologetic about it yeah, and yeah. I'm still a little apologetic about it but it's it's what I fucking do well, now so. and, and as a comedian too like uh, sometimes when people uh, say they've saw me on stage uh, my first instinct is to oh I'm terribly sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> you know right because it's funny right? oh what did you think what did you think yeah no I'm just I'm sorry um, <laughs> uh, yeah so oh and also before I ask you the final question um, where can um, where can folks uh, purchase your music? Uh, the the best place for me, if they want to purchase music, is off of my website. So there's a, a link to download the albums or uh, order them physically in physical copies, uh, which means you'll get it in an envelope in the mail in CD form. Uh, my website is myname.com, so orichimoni.com, and we'll... Uh, Make sure that's spelled out somewhere on that's O R I T S H I M O N I dot com. Excellent, excellent spelling skills, Josh Dunn. Yeah, yeah, I, I almost touched it. <laughs> I got it. Uh, yeah, and on that topic, you know, like uh, I looked at the numbers the other day because I had to for some application, and it was like the number of streams compared to the number of downloads is like there's like a couple of zeros difference like (laughs) it's nuts it's nuts and i'm really delighted that uh, through very little effort of mine once it's out there like this shit's getting streamed in india and hungary and like random seeming places but streams like if all of those people would have spent one dollar yeah i would have bought a house yeah 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 literally so it's uh that's yeah it's if you want to support artists uh, musicians in particular um, and you like streaming as your way of consuming music and listening that's really cool and then just maybe consider like a little donation send, send folks send, send us money send a dollar send two dollars if everybody doing it we gonna make some mad screw I'd be able to go uh, get some help from my back basically yeah, that's, that, that's the thing is like oh life is actually is getting more expensive because I right. need help with things that yep. I I can't do every. I can't eat French fries and drink coffee, and that be my diet for the next ten years, which I did for the first two. You're not Tom Waits. Not that he does that, but he. I, I feel like he does. Yeah, it's like <laughs> you just don't give a shit in the beginning until your body's like, if you want to keep going, you're gonna have to meet me halfway. Sweet. So you in, and so next you're doing shows in Ottawa, right? Uh, Ottawa, Ontario in general. So Ottawa, Ontario. Toronto, Guelph, and Picton. And then, uh, and then I'm taking another writing break. Ooh. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I've got like little, I'm not, uh, killing myself right now with, uh, too many gigs cause I do need to repair mm-hmm. my spine, uh, but just enough to kind of keep it going. And then I'll be back in Europe in the spring. Um, yeah. So folks, so you check out her website, orichimoni.com where you can, uh, follow her uh touring and and buy her wares and also um if you are a 
a good chiropractor. She will give you. <laughs> I'll a, marry you. <laughs> she'll, well, that's farther than I would go. I was going to say she'd she'd give you a discount on stuff if you gave her treatment. But I the, have had trades. I've had a pretty good massage for CD deal happen right. a couple of times. So yeah, I and do. She has hinted at a massage for marriage. So well. <laughs> Um, if those <laughs> if those back pills start kicking in, folks, maybe you'll get lucky. We or unlucky, like me, <laughs> and not with her, but with everything <laughs> else. Um, okay, so with that foolishness in mind, I am gonna uh, wind this down and ask you the final question. That being, what do you think the meaning of life is? I actually know the answer to that. I'm curious. Do tell. I Someone asked me that once very spontaneously, and I uh, thought quietly for about two seconds and said, time. Time is the meaning of life. No matter how you slice it, time is the meaning of life. There is no meaning of life without the passing of time. Right. Yeah. Just time. It's, it's inevitable, inescapable. So I mean, of course, like love and peace and all the fluffy stuff but like it's it all comes down to time we are all subject to the laws of time folk so don't be early don't be late don't be wasting it don't you dare be <laughs> do hesitate don't, don't you, I, I tried to make that rhyme is that but a rhyme okay it, it, uh, the grammar didn't work but it rhymed um so so uh, time um being the key uh we're all subject to it um Folks, uh, we're don't, out of time, folks. We're out of time, so uh, don't waste your life. Turn this <laughs> stuff off. Do something productive with your time, ladies and gentlemen. She's been Orit Shimoni. I've been Josh Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn. That's Mr. Dunn to you. Um, this has been Gimpin' Ain't Easy because it ain't episode 16. And you remember, like I tells you, every time. Especially when you're feeling low. You look yourself in the mirror. You give yourself that Ric Flair. Woo! Do one for me. I don't think I can. She can't woo, folks. So woo for her. <laughs> and tell yourselves, I am the greatest of all time. I know I am. Good night, folks. Aww. Good night, Josh.